Now, there is a sound. It worked. <laughs> a, f a sound that is desperately, f desperately familiar to most of us, and of course it's the sound of the alarm clock. And what that truly ghastly, awful sound does is stop the single most important behavioral experience that we have, and that's sleep. If you're an average sort of person, 36% of your life will be spent asleep, which means that if you live to 90, then 32 years, 32 years will have been spent entirely asleep. Now, what that 32 years is telling us, that sleep at some level is important. What do we do in the 20th century about sleep? Well, of course, we use Thomas Edison's light bulb to invade the night, and we occupied the dark. And, and, it, and in the process of this occupation, we've treated sleep as an illness, almost. We've, we've treated it as an enemy, an enemy. Why is it? Why do we abandon sleep in our thoughts? Well, it's because you don't do anything much while you're asleep, it seems. You don't eat, you don't drink, and you don't have sex. Well, most of us anyway. Um, and, and, and so therefore, it's, sorry, it, it, it's a complete waste of time, right? Wrong. When you're asleep, this thing doesn't shut down. In fact, some areas of the brain are actually more active during the sleep state than during the wake state. So why do we sleep? And it won't surprise any of you that, of course, as scientists, we don't have a consensus. There are dozens of different ideas about why we sleep. And I'm going to outline three of those. The first is sort of the restoration idea, and it's somewhat intuitive. Essentially, all the stuff we've burnt up during the day, we restore, we replace, we rebuild during the night. What about energy conservation? Again, perhaps intuitive. Um, um, you essentially sleep to save calories. Now, when you do the sums, though, it doesn't really pan out. But the third idea I'm quite attracted to, which is brain processing and memory consolidation. What we know is that if after you've tried to learn a task and you sleep-deprive individuals, the ability to learn that task is smashed. It's, it's really hugely uh, attenuated. So sleep and memory consolidation is also very important. However, it's not just the laying down of memory and recalling it. What's turned out to be really exciting is that our ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems is hugely enhanced by a night of sleep. In fact, it's been estimated to give us a threefold advantage. Sleeping at night um, enhances our creativity. And what seems to be going on is that in the brain, those neural connections that are important, those synaptic connections that are important, are linked and strengthened, while those that are less important tend to sort of fade away and be less important. So let's now look at sleep deprivation. Huge sectors of society are sleep deprived. And let's look at our sleepometer. So in the 1950s, good data suggests that most of us were getting around about eight hours of sleep a night. Nowadays, we sleep one and a half to two hours less every night. So we're in the sort of six and a half hours every night league. For teenagers, it's, it's worse, much worse. They need nine hours for full brain performance, and many of them on a school night are only getting five hours of sleep. It's simply not enough. One of the things that the brain does is indulge in microsleeps, this involuntary falling asleep, and you have essentially no control over it. Now, microsleeps can be sort of somewhat embarrassing, but they can also be deadly. It's been estimated that 31% of drivers will fall asleep at the wheel at least once in their life. And in the US, the statistics are pretty good. 100,000 accidents on the freeway have been associated with tiredness, loss of vigilance, and falling asleep. 100,000 a year is extraordinary. At another level of terror, we dip into the tragic accidents at Chernobyl and indeed the Space Shuttle Challenger, which was so tragically lost. And in the investigations that followed those disasters, poor judgment as a result of extended shift work and loss of vigilance and tiredness was attributed to be a, ch a big chunk of, of those, those disasters. So, when you're tired and you lack sleep, you have poor memory, you have poor creativity, you have increased impulsiveness, and you have overall poor judgment. But my friends, it's so much worse than that. <laughs> If you are a tired brain, the brain is craving things to make it up. So 
drugs, stimulants, caffeine represents the stimulant of choice across much of the Western world. Much of the day is fueled by caffeine, and if you're a really naughty, tired brain, nicotine. And of course, you're fueling the waking state with these uh, stimulants, and then of course it gets to 11 o'clock at night, and the brain says to itself, ah, well actually, I need to be asleep fairly shortly. What do we do about that when I'm feeling completely wired? Well, of course, you then resort to alcohol. Now, alcohol, short term, you know, once or twice, to use to mildly sedate you, can be very useful. It can actually ease the, the sleep transition. But what you must be so aware of is that alcohol doesn't provide sleep, a biological mimic for sleep. It sedates you. So it actually harms some of those neural processing that's going on during memory consolidation and memory recall. So it's, it's a short-term acute measure, but for goodness sake, don't become addicted to alcohol as a way of getting to sleep every night. Another connection between lo loss of sleep is weight gain. If you sleep around about five hours of less every night, then you have a 50% likelihood of being obese. What's the connection here? Well, Sleep loss seems to give rise to the release of the hormone ghrelin, the hunger hormone. Ghrelin is released, it gets, gets to the brain, the brain says, I need carbohydrates. And what it does is seek out carbohydrates and particularly sugars. So there's our link between tiredness and the metabolic predisposition for weight gain. Stress. Tired people are massively stressed. Um, and one of the things of stress, of course, is loss of memory, which is uh, what, what I uh, sort of just then had a little lapse of. Um, and, 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 but stress is so much more. Um, so if you're, if you're acutely stressed, not a great problem, uh, but it's sustained stress associated with sleep loss that's the problem. So sustained stress leads, us, leads to suppressed immunity. And so tired people tend to have higher rates of overall infection, and there's some very good studies showing that shift workers, for example, have higher rates of cancer. Um, increased levels of stress throw glucose into the circulation. Uh, glucose becomes a, a, a dominant part of the vasculature and uh, essentially you become glucose intolerant, therefore diabetes too. Uh, stress increases cardiovascular disease as a result of raising, raising blood pressure. Well, how do I know whether I'm getting enough sleep? Well, it's not rocket science. If you need an alarm clock to get you out of bed in the morning, um, if you are taking a long time to get up, if you need lots of stimulants, if you're grumpy, if you're irritable, if you're told by your work colleagues that you're looking tired and irritable, chances are you are sleep deprived. Listen to them. Listen to yourself. What do you do? Well, and this is slightly offensive, sleep for dummies. Um, <laughs> make your bedroom a haven for sleep. The first critical thing is make it as dark as you possibly can and also make it slightly cool. Very important. Actually, reduce your amount of light exposure at least half an hour before you go to bed. Light increases levels of alertness and will delay sleep. What's the last thing that most of us do before we go to bed? We stand in a massively lit bathroom um, with looking into the mirror, cleaning our teeth. It's the worst thing we could possibly do to, 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 before we went to sleep. Turn off those mobile phones, turn off those computers, turn off all of those things that are also going to excite the brain. Try not to drink caffeine too late in the day. Um, ideally, not after lunch. Now, we said about reducing light exposure before you go to bed, but light exposure in the morning is very good at setting the biological clock to the light-dark cycle, so seek out morning light. Okay, that's some facts. What about some myths? Teenagers are lazy. No, poor things. They have a biological predisposition to go to bed late and get up late, so give them a break. So, let me just finish. What I started by saying is take sleep seriously. Our attitudes towards sleep are so very different from a pre-industrial age, when we were almost wrapped in a duvet. We used to understand intuitively the importance of sleep. And this isn't some sort of crystal-waving nonsense. This is a pragmatic response to good health. If you have good sleep, it increases your concentration, attention, decision-making, creativity, social skills, health. If you get sleep, it reduces your mood changes, your stress, your levels of anger, your impulsivity, and your tendency to drink and take drugs.